We are continuing this morning Matthew chapter 10. In fact, we'll finish Matthew chapter 10 as we look at the subject of what a Christ follower looks like. So what does a Christ follower look like? Jesus is going to help us to understand that this morning in the process of our thoughts and how we need to think differently than we do. Think of it this way. To get out of a mess, you need to think differently than you, how you thought when you got into your mess, right? Okay, now you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we think and do the Christ-following life? Are you a Christ follower? Jesus tells us this is what a Christ follower looks like, our thought process and our action process. He puts them both together in words that I think are pretty simple to understand, so I hope I don't complicate any of it. Are you ready? We begin looking at the first thing. What does a Christ follower look like? A Christ follower looks fearless. Why? Because we know that God is for you. Verse 27, Jesus says, as he's been talking with his disciples, and he just finished saying, you will be persecuted when you live for me. That was the section we saw last time. And then here he goes on and he says, whatever I tell you in the dark, you will be persecuted, but understand this, whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin, and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Verse 31, do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So Jesus begins here, he says, whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light, and what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. John MacArthur notes that in the days of Jesus, first, uh, first century Israel, in the days of Christ, the rabbis, he notes, would often train their students to speak by standing next to them and whispering in their ear. And what they would hear whispered in the ear, the new student would speak to the people who are listening. Now, I think that would be kind of a trip. Let's say Skyler's up here, you know, Skyler who did the announcements, and since Henry's done announcements here for a long time, Henry's up here standing next to Skylar. Now say this. No, 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 you said it wrong. Say it like this. Oh, I mean, that would be, wouldn't that be weird? People do that, though, in our time with uh, earpieces, and somebody will be speaking to them what to say. But MacArthur goes on, what the Lord speaks through his word, likewise we are to speak aloud to the world. The message of Jesus was public. It was not a message for the secret few, and it was not to be hidden in any way. There isn't one message for the inner circle, just you guys, and then another message for everybody else on the outside. Jesus had conversations in living rooms and on boats. He had them on mountaintops and on the seashore. The message of the gospel that I give you boys, he's talking to his 12 apostles, the message of the gospel that I give you in the living room or on the mountaintop or out there on the boat is the same message that you are to give to everyone because whosoever believes in me will not perish but have everlasting life. The message that I whisper in your ears or tell you on the boat or up on the mountaintop, it is the message for the whosoevers. It is the message that is for everyone. The message of Jesus is for anyone who would receive him, young and old, those in prison and those who put them in prison. It does not matter what color of skin. It does not matter what language you speak. It does not matter if you are rich or poor. Even if you receive the truth of Christ's word that was whispered in your ear on a deathbed, you can be forgiven. The message of Christ is not for the select few. It is for anyone who would receive him and as i mentioned even on a deathbed I, I was thinking of this this past week and i i shared this with the men and women the other night at the at the banquet that we had for the two ministries but i, I have a friend that i grew up with i've known him since i was four years old and we're still friends we don't live in the same area he lives down by the beach i don't but we've been friends for for 
over 50 years. To me, that's crazy that, that uh, that's so cool because a lot of people just don't have that. But we've actually been friends for that long and we grew up together. He, he was raised Lutheran. I was raised Catholic. And his family was always trying to get me converted. I remember when I was real young, and it was back in the 60s, and Billy Graham, I think Billy Graham had come to uh, L.A. or Anaheim or something like that, and going to preach at one of the stadiums. And my friend's trying to get me to go to the Billy Graham crusade, and we were, we were young, and, and uh, his mom and dad are trying to get me to go, and, or his mom was, not his dad. But um, my mom is saying, you are not going. That stuff, those, that guy's crazy. He's a weirdo, or whatever my mom said. Anyways. But none of us are Lutheran or Catholic anymore, but we are all pretty much saved, and uh, praise the Lord. But um, what happened was, uh, we've been friends, as I mentioned, for many, many, many years, and his dad, Tom was his name, he uh, went to church all of his life, and he passed away on Tuesday morning, 87 years old, and went to church all of his life, and uh, the last 30 years or so, he's at EV Free in Fullerton, 35 years, EV Free in Fullerton. And he would go because his wife, my friend's mom, made him go to church. He did not want to go to church. And he had a lot of anger. He, was, he, he had challenges in that area all of his life. He did not like God, didn't want anything to do with God. And uh, the family asked me, said, can you come see my dad so I drove out to Brea on Monday and went and saw him but the pastor one of the pastors of their church had just gone and visited him a few days before and it was glorious he received Christ just a few days before I got there and I got to talk with him and I get there and my friend's mom says will you go in and just make sure that he's uh <laughs> and I said certainly so I went into the room and started talking to him about Christ and then he, he said some funny things. He said, are, he asked me about Christ. Are you sure this is right? And I said, I am banking everything on my life is this being right. Everything in my life is, is wrapped up in this being right. And he said, he goes, I've never, I never knew you could feel this way. Just from what happened just a few days before. All this anger that he had. What had happened was when he was a little boy, I, I don't know if he was four years old or five years old. Both his mom and dad were killed by tragedy. And uh, he had that all of his life, 87 years, he carried anger with him toward God. And he said this while I was there just talking with him. And he's talking about heaven. And I read to him 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I has not seen nor ears heard the things that God has prepared for those who love him. We talked about other things in heaven. A place where there's no more tear, no more sorrow, no more pain for the former things passed away. We we're talking about all of these different things. And then he said this, and I thought this is so cool. All this anger, 87 years, mad at God. His mom and dad were both killed tragically when he was just a little boy. And he said with a great big smile on his face, he said this, I get to meet my dad. I get to meet my dad. This is an 87-year-old man. It's like a little, it was like listening to him say that. Oh, man, that's reality. Do you know that? I, it just struck me. Wow, I get to meet my dad. We get to meet our Heavenly Father. We get to see Jesus face to face. He says, hey, don't contain this message right here. This message is for the whosoevers. Whatever I tell you here, I whisper in your ear, your devotion, you hear from the pulpit, I want you to go out there and tell people, man, we get to meet our Heavenly Father and be even reunited with those who have gone before us in Christ. I get to meet my dad. That is just so cool. Do not fear, Jesus goes on. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both the body and soul in hell. Wow, people say Jesus never talked about hell. He did, he did indeed. In fact, this word hell is Gehenna, also translated Valley of Hinnom. When you go to Jerusalem, you will see the Valley of Hinnom. When you're just driving above it, you think, wow, that's kind of a pretty valley. You know, it's not much around the Valley of Hinnom. Some things are built down there on the sides of the Valley of Hinnom or Gehenna or the Valley of Hell. And then you get the story of the Valley of Hell or the Valley of Hinnom or, or, or 
Valley of Gehenna. It's where all the trash was burnt. The refuse was taken to the Valley of Hinnom. It was a disgusting place in the days of Jesus. It was a place where the fire burned all day and all night. All of the rubbish, all of the refuse, all of the trash out there. Oh, disgusting stench and smell. The fire never went out. It was also the place in the Old Testament where King Manasseh sacrificed the thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands and thousands and thousands of baby boys and girls on the arms of Molech in the fire. And you, you know, when you tell that story, when you're in Jerusalem, you're looking at the bus and you start to tell it to all the people who've never been there before, you see shock come over their face because you're thinking, oh, it looks so pretty. Yeah, hell looks real pretty from a distance. And this last trip, you know, or, or as we're, our bus is going through it, our tour guide says, now we are going through the valley of hell. And fortunately, you come out on the other side. But this, this word for hell, Gehenna, it also means, Strong's Concordance, the place of everlasting punishment. So Jesus used real things, that valley there in Jerusalem, to illustrate an eternal principle. God is the one to fear, not the men who persecute the followers of Jesus, not people who may physically harm you. The physical pain will be temporary, but one day the physical pain will be gone forever, never to be brought up again. The emotional pain, all of those things that happen in life, gone forever, but hell is forever. So here Jesus says, fear God. Now, that's a strange thing. Well, I don't want to be afraid of God. Here's the thing. Fear, fearing God carries two different applications in the Bible. Did you know that? You'll often hear a preacher talk about one of the applications or the other application, but they both apply, and Jesus is using the thought and the application of both of them right here in this text. There's the fear of God, the reverence, the holy reverence of God, but there's also the fear of God. He's telling us here the fear that you need to be afraid. Because he is the one who can cast you in to hell forever. If a person rejects God all of their life, and then they die rejecting God, you better be very afraid because God will respect your decision to reject him. God will not make a person go to heaven that says, I don't want to go there. God will not make a person love Jesus that says, I don't want anything to do with Jesus. He will honor their decision. They will be forever separated from God because that's what they wanted. And then they will end up in this place called hell where the fire never stops. You say, man, you better be very afraid of that. So there's the two different kinds of fear. There's the one fear that is a reverential awe of the holiness of God. That's the place where believers can stay. And there's the other fear that if you don't know God, oh, you better be very afraid. But for those who are believers in Christ, it's remembering this type of fear like like this. As Spurgeon said, there is no cure for the fear of man like the fear of God. So here Jesus says, hey, don't fear what man can do to you. Fear God. Have a holy reverence for God, for who he is. I I love this. The uh, reformer, Hugh Latimer, who was martyred for his faith. He is burned alive for his faith in Christ several centuries ago. One of the the early reformers. He's going to stand before the king of England and preach Christ to him. And and listen to this. When Hugh Latimer was preaching one day in the presence of King Henry VIII, he reports that he said to himself, Oh, Latimer, Latimer, remember that the king is here. Be careful what you say to the king. In other words, don't say too much about Christ to the king. And then Latimer said to himself, Latimer, Latimer, remember that the king of kings is here. Be careful what you do not say. For such unflinching faithfulness, Hugh Latimer was eventually burned at the stake, but he feared failing God more than he feared failing men. So this is what Jesus is saying. Don't fear men. Fear God. Then he says, do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. As a follower of Christ, we do not need to be afraid because God really does care for us, even down to the most minute detail. He even says here, he even, look at this, this is crazy. The very hairs of your head are all numbered. Now, some of you may look a little bit like Uncle Fester. That's okay. Remember Uncle Fester? And there's not much there to count. 
But others have a lot of hair. And can you imagine? Are the numbers of our hair are numbered? I wonder, you know, like when you, if you're like me, you're, you're getting your hair ready in the morning, there's stuff in the sink, right? You look, you go, and God's up there, it was number 7,322. <laughs> and we're thinking, wow, it's just looking at more hair. It gets into the very hairs of your hair are numbered. I mean, when I think of that, I think, you know, to me, that's kind of crazy. But it's a reminder that when trouble comes our way, we tend to slip into a place of thinking that God has forgotten about us, but he has not. God knows us better than, than our friends know us. He knows us better than our, our husband or wife knows us. He knows us better than we can know ourselves. And he wants us to know that he knows every single thing that has gone wrong and that he cares for us. So don't worry about it. He cares for us. 1 Peter chapter 5, cast all your care or all your troubles on him, for he cares for you. And I love what the psalmist wrote. You number my, wa my wanderings, put my tears into your bottle. We get this picture of God in heaven with a great big bottle and a great big teardropper. And every tear you've ever cried from when you were just a little baby boy or a little girl and, and all the way through your life, you have this picture of God. He saved them all up. And then we get to heaven and say, aha, not only did I know your hairs were numbered, but I got all your tears saved in this bottle. Isn't that crazy? Wow. When, w w are they not all in your book? When I cry out to you, then my enemies will turn back. This I know because God is for me. I love that God is for me. He is for me. He's for you. Here the emphasis is on do not fear. It's a reminder, the one that fears God has no need to fear anything or anyone else. And then we move on to the next section after he's dealing with fear and saying, God is for you. He says this, verse 32, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Wow. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Wow! Those are some harsh words. Does he mean you're not supposed to love your mom or dad or your husband or wife or your kids? Well, of course not. So, so what's going on here? The first section was be fearless, right? For God is for you. The second is it, the, the Christ follower is to be selfless. We are to love Christ first. And this is the point he's making. Whoever confesses me before men, he begins, uh, him I also will confess before my Father who is in heaven. The disciple is to go public again with his faith, right? So, so that's what's going on here. Think of it like this. If we don't tell others about Christ, why would we think that he will tell the Father about us? So often we want to keep a secret of our relationship with Christ. You say, no, no, that's not what this is all about. Everyone Jesus called, he called them publicly. There's really no such thing as a secret Christian. And, and by the way, this passage here that we just read, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father in heaven. This passage, if I could single out a single passage on why I do altar calls, you know what altar calls are? The opportunity I give people to stand and come forward and repent and receive Christ before others is based on this. It's an, all it is is an opportunity for people to publicly proclaim Christ. But really it's just the first step. That's all that really is. Because when you look at the nuts and bolts of what Jesus is saying here, in all truth, this verse goes even beyond the altar call. This has to do with life outside of the four walls of the church building. There must be times when the individual Christian has enough evidence in their actions and in their words that they can be identified as a Christ follower. As more than one author has stated, 
It is to be feared that many modern Christians, if arrested for the crime of following Jesus and they were tried in court, they would have the charges dismissed for lack of evidence. He's saying, listen, it needs to be public and it needs to be obvious by your thoughts and your actions that you are a follower of me. Think of it like this. Whatever Jesus Christ is to you on earth, you will be to him in the day of judgment. If you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. If you really are a genuine believer in Christ, man, whatever he really is to you today, ah, you will be to him on that day. As Spurgeon said, if Christ be dear and precious to you, you will be precious and dear to him. If you thought everything of him, he will think everything of you. However, if you were embarrassed of him, he will be embarrassed of you. If you did not receive him, he will not receive you. Wow. And then Jesus continues, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. Well, wait a minute. Isn't the message of the gospel the gospel of peace? It is. In fact, at his birth, good tidings, great peace to all men. Joy to the world. We sing it at Christmas time. But it's an eternal peace and a peace with God, and men don't really care about that. Men don't like to think about eternity And men don't really care much about peace with God. And as such, his sword of his word and his truth naturally results in a sword that divides families and friends. It is a sword that can cut deep, and many don't like it. But what does he mean here? It still doesn't make sense, Pastor Tom. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Daughter-in-law against mother-in-law, brother against brother, sister against sister, child against parent. I don't get it. How can you love God, who you can't see more than the people down here on the earth that you get along with, that you can see? You say, man, it's got to be me first. In very strong terms, Jesus explained that the disciple must love and follow Jesus supremely. Our devotion to the Lord must come above all all else and when we put God first understand this when we put God first we should expect that we are better husbands the wife should expect that she'd be a better wife better parents children better children honoring their parents better relationships with other people You would expect it would be better when Christ is first. However, the message of the gospel also divides. The problem with the message of the gospel and why it divides is because it's convicting. It cuts deep. It's a two-edged sword, right? And what the gospel tells you is this. You are not good enough. And people do not like that. The religion that you grew up with is not good enough. And people do not like that. When I um, go to Israel, you really hear it there, especially in our case, we usually get a messianic tour guide. A messianic tour guide means a person who's Jewish that came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They're a messianic Jew, right? Right? Oh, man, they will tell you the stories, how they came to Christ and how suddenly it is a divided world for them. They are shunned by the other Jews. They are shunned by family if their family is also no longer Jews. In the Islamic world, they will tell you there, you come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be kicked out of the family, very good chance, off with your head. This is what Jesus is saying. It cuts deep because it says your religion that you grew up with is not good enough. You are not a good enough person. Oh, man, that stings in our world today. When I was raised, I was raised Catholic. And, man, 
when I became saved, my mom was convinced I had joined a cult. Some people who know me from years ago, they think I'm a cult leader now because I'm here. And my mom's over that part, but I've talked with many a people who come to Christ. And, and when they first come to Christ, may, maybe the husband comes to Christ. And their, their marriage wasn't all that great. He comes to Christ. And, but now it's even worse because the wife says, well, you're no longer a drunk. I'm used to you being a loser or whatever it is. And now you've cleaned up your life. Or whatever. Listen, I've seen it many times, and then they can't get along at all. But the good news is also that often what happens, one person comes to Christ, and after time they realize they really are a better person. They're not going out drinking. They're not carousing. They're not doing this. Way. Well, I like that. They're better. There's a better dad, better mom. You end up seeing the whole family come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's cool. But the message of the gospel divides. I couldn't get through this message preparing it this week without coming up with the obvious. We've got problems in our country. And I came across this article. I'll read part of it to you. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But we've got problems. Christ is the only one who has the solution. This author wrote, on April 14th, uh, Billy Graham, or Franklin Graham, excuse me, Stated, America is in trouble. I've lived long enough to learn that neither the Democrats nor the Republicans can turn this country around. No political party or politician is the answer. The only hope for this country is Almighty God and His Son, Jesus Christ. He continues, America is no longer the nation it used to be. This author is much older than me. And he wrote, as a youth, I knew many church members who attended church every time the door was open. They loved Jesus and his church. They prayed beautiful prayers. They witnessed to their neighbors. They took people to church with them and professed to believe everything the Bible says. They attended midweek Bible studies and all of their revival services and even visited during revivals at other churches. Their homes were havens of safety. Their doors and windows were open day and night. There were no gangs. Their children could play outside at night. He continues, many teachers had a Bible on their desks that they read to their students. Many schools had a chapel service at least once a week, and, a different, and different preachers even preached. Times were harder than he continues. Many had no, more, no money. Those who lived out in the country were just getting electricity and telephones. Many didn't have indoor plumbing. Television was just coming on the market, but many had never seen one. Some were patched in secondhand clothes. Some raised everything they ate. And then he continues, it was God who brought these people through those hard times. He gave them electricity to make their lives better. It was God who gave them life and health and good jobs. It was God who gave them victory over their enemies. He let them gain wealth, get a better education. He was answering their prayers and blessing their service and faithfulness. But as Henry J. Kaiser said, when wealth accumulates, men decay. I will add that when men get educated the wrong way, men decay. He writes, God's blessings piled up and some who were blessed started sleeping late on Sunday. Others started spending the day at the golf course. Many took their expensive boats to the lake. And on Sunday night and Wednesday night, they were in front of their, their, their big screen TVs. Instead of getting closer to God with each passing day, they got farther and farther away. It wasn't long until the educated wanted prayer out of schools, and then they wanted the Bibles and Ten Commandments to go. Then they wanted to stop all mention of God. And their daughter started getting pregnant before marriage, and it has evolved to their sons marrying other males, and nudity crept into their big screen TVs, and pornography became readily available on their latest smartphones. And then he goes on from there in states in the most prestigious religious schools at the most prestigious religious schools there has been growing trend of professors with multiple degrees who don't know God and don't believe the Bible they compromise the word of God by teaching tolerance and inclusiveness turning out students after their own image the image of the professor instead of the image of the Lord Jesus Christ and then he, he concludes and he says so America really is in trouble the Democrats and Republicans can't turn America around. Those multi-degreed professors can't turn this country around. Almighty God and his son Jesus didn't leave America, but America has left them. I look at that and think, 
the reality of, of where we are. We have, a, we have a world that's divided. We have a country that is divided. And to that, Jesus says, I've got the solution. Verse 38, take up your cross and follow me. When a person took up the cross in Jesus' day, it was for one reason. It was to die. When the Roman general Varus had broken the revolt of Judas in Galilee in 4 BC, he crucified 2,000 Jews and placed the crosses by the wayside along the roads to Galilee to send a message. This is what being crucified on a cross does. It kills you. The ancient Roman cross did not negotiate, it did not compromise, it did not make deals. There was no looking back when you took up your cross, and your only hope was in the future of a resurrected life. The cross reminds us of two things, dying to self and living for God. It reminds us of death, right, and it reminds us of resurrection. And Jesus says, he who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Our problem is the thought. We think we are giving up something good for something boring when we will not die to ourself. It's, it's understanding it correctly. Don't think of it as giving something up but finding something better um, let me illustrate for you all right think of a young boy right before and after the puberty stage pastor tom what does this have to do with dying to yourself i hope this makes sense because if it doesn't <laughs> just like me on facebook so let's see how this goes oh, oh, this is really short Young boy, puberty, he stinketh. He goes to school and he plays all day and he stinketh. He comes home from school. I know, I have a 13-year-old. He puts his clothes on the floor in his room. They do not make it to the washing area where they're supposed to be. They stinketh. Anybody else understand that? Okay. He stinketh. His clothes stinketh. His feet are off the hook, stinketh, right? They stink. He doesn't think he stinks. He doesn't think his room stinks. He thinks he smells wonderful. But I know it happens to boys. They start to think, hey, she's cute. That girl recognizes he stinketh. That boy recognizes I don't think I stink, but she thinks I stink. She's cute, therefore I better take a shower and use deodorant, right? Here's the, if we, we give up what stinketh for something that is far better, even if we don't realize it stinketh, God knows it stinketh. Does that make sense? So the puberty thing I can use for second and third? We, 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 it's a mindset. We die to what really does stink in God's eyes and God's nose. We die to self. It's, it's a paradox. Only the um, it, Christian can, by losing it, he finds it. By dying to this life, does he really gain life? So this is what Jesus is saying. Lastly, what else should a Christian, a Christ follower look like? Uh, it ought to look like a blessing to care for others. Verse 40, he who receives you receives me. He who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. Whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water, in the name of a disciple, assuredly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. Wow. I, I, I look at this and... I'm, I'm preparing this message this week, and we have all that's going on in Baltimore, right? The New York City, Philadelphia, Seattle, all these places throughout our country. 
And this picture, many of you saw it. This is so cool. This comes out of Baltimore. When I'm reading about the cup of cold water, and, and you see this little kid. Did anybody see that picture? That was so awesome. Just giving them the, it, enemies by the world standard, right? This is the point Jesus is making. Ultimately, we, we get to, the, the message is for those on the inside, the church, and those who are on the outside of the church, too. But what Jesus is saying here, we do have a divided world. And, and by the way, just for the record, there's no way the human experiment will ever, ever, ever work. Only Christ can make it work. In heaven, do you know there, there's only one race? The human race. And the human race comes in all different colors and shapes and sizes. You know that? So man is trying to create utopia and leave Christ out. But we know, and the preachers back there in Baltimore, I've been listening to many of them, they know people need Christ. But the world don't want him. But I look at this, and, and, and I can't help but think um, that Jesus here, he's talking about rewards, those two sets of rewards. There's a reward for those who are supporting those who are doing the work. He who receives you receives me, he says, for those that do good to the disciples of Jesus. Here Jesus says, you bless them, you bless me. He says, they're the ones doing the work by being a blessing to them. You are blessing me. And then he says this. He promises a reward. He who receives a prophet in the name of the prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. Jesus uses rewards for motivation. I talk to many Christians that say, you know, you should never be motivated by a reward. Well, you can think whatever you want to think, but Jesus talks about rewards. The Old Testament talks about rewards. The New Testament talks about rewards. God talked about rewards. Jesus talked about the rewards. The Apostle Paul talked about rewards. Hebrews chapter 11, listen to this. Moses is said to have refused the passing pleasures of sin, choosing instead the reproach of Christ. Hebrews chapter 11, why? Because he looked for the reward. So if it's good enough for God and good enough for Jesus, to motivate us to do something by promising a reward, then I figure I ought to teach about the promise of a reward. Here's the reality of it. As a believer in Christ, you've, you've repented, you've asked Christ to forgive you, right? Great! Guess what? We're going to go to heaven. However, you get to store your treasure in heaven. In so many different ways. By serving Him inside a church, outside a church. By how we live, how we love, how we forgive, how we care. Be motivated by a reward causes us to check our motives. Is my heart right toward this person? Is my attitude toward, right toward this thing I am doing? Our tithing, we store treasure in heaven. Our offerings, we store treasure in heaven. The rewards motivate us to be a blessing rather than a burden. God knows that, even if we don't want to admit it. Listen, think of it like this. We're all going to heaven, right? But let's say you get no rewards. Because the Bible does talk about having everything burned up, but you still get in, right? So you'll still be happy in heaven, right? Okay, this is what you'll be like in heaven. You'll be like a monkey playing a cymbal, sitting there. Woohoo! I'm happy for eternity. Listen, I don't want to be a monkey in heaven. I don't. I'll be happy. But man, I want to store my treasure in heaven. So we go all in and we go all out for God. And he says, he who receives a prophet and the name of the prophet receives a prophet man, prophet's reward. He who receives a righteous man in the name of righteousness receives the righteous man's reward. It's understanding, even the missionary. You might be thinking, well, I want to be a missionary, but I'm not a missionary. Well, you know what? By helping support a missionary, you get to partake of the missionary's reward. That's what Jesus is saying here. You partake of it. You support it. You encourage it. You go forward. And then when you get to heaven, you don't have to be like a monkey there. Man, you got all kinds of treasure. And other people could be the monkeys with symbols. You don't have to be. Does it make sense? 
Okay, good, because I've got to wrap this up. It's also a reward for caring. Whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, assuredly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. Given a cup of cold water, there's hence the picture of the little boy. It's the little one giving the old guy. In the world's eyes, enemies, in, in Jesus' eyes, this is what, yeah, right? Of Midas, it's fabled that whatever he touched turned into gold. As Trapp says, sure, it is that whatsoever the hand of charity touch, be it a cup of cold water, it turns the same, not into gold, but into heaven itself. So we give a cup of water. You do these little things. It's being a blessing for others. What does a Christ follower look like? Fearless. God is with you. Selfless, putting Christ first. You are a blessing, caring for others because of what Christ has done for us. Listen, right now we're going to enter into a time of communion. So I am going to invite Pastor Henry up. He is going to lead us into that time of communion as we go to the place of remembering what Christ has done for us. Father, we thank you for this time. We pray that you bless our communion. In Jesus' name, amen.